brother, John, is actually some who I worked with in the past. Uh, he and I worked when I worked at a startup company. And I don't know if you'll share this story, John, but I actually reached out to, um, I follow John on Twitter. He has shares a lot of really great content. And I reached out to him through a Twitter message. So this is a testament to us marketers, right? That you never know when somebody's going to reach out. So with that, I want to welcome John and thank him for um, being with us this morning. John? Glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for the great introduction, Israel. Uh, I'm CEO and founder of The Good. We help e-commerce and SaaS brands to convert more of their visitors into customers. So our mission is to remove all of the bad online experiences until only the good remain. So we've been doing this for about 15 years now. Today, what we're going to cover is uh, how to convert more of your leads into buyers. And what I really want to talk about today is... Uh, walk you through a bunch of core tenants. So some of you saw me back there with a book, Opting Into Optimization. Uh, these is a sample of those from the book. And uh, really, there's a lot of ways you can get lost in conversion optimization. There's best practices out there. If you search the term, you're going to get checklists, you're going to get uh, a whole bunch of tactics that you should deploy. The challenge with this is that uh, really, you don't know where to start. And it becomes really difficult to understand what to apply to your site. So what I want to talk about today is some theory, not necessarily the specific tactics. I want to talk more about uh, the ways that you should be thinking about CRO and help you get through uh, all of these, you know, the bog of dark UX patterns, like tricking people into, into converting. And, uh, you know, all of these different things like discounting that really just sets your brand up for failure in the long term. So what we're going to cover is that and uh, three of the laws out of the book. There's nine in the book. So uh, if you uh, didn't pick up a copy, you still want one. Uh, there's a lady, uh, my uh, teammate Katie in the back uh, with a pink shirt on has a bunch of them. So feel free to do that. And then we had a, a volunteer guinea pig, as Annalisa called herself this morning, uh, that we're going to do a live uh, assessment of uh, the Autodesk page of her site. So we can put that little theory into practice for you. So first thing I want to cover is what is conversion optimization? Uh, this gets um, you know, muddled quite a bit. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, you can find best practices, things of that sort. But when done right, you can really see some massive gains out of this. And it really is one of the most effective tools in a marketer's toolbox. So well, I want to talk for a second about what true conversion rate optimization is. And I know this is a mouthful, a data-backed system for increasing the percentage of website visitors that convert into customers, or more generally, just take a desired action that you want them to. And I know it's a mouthful, so we're going to focus on this bit by bit today as kind of a guidepost for as we walk through this. But the first thing I really want to say is we're going to focus on data-backed. And the reality out of this is that CRO isn't about trying random tactics. It's not about doing a checklist, right? It's about having the right data and making data back decisions. So that's why our first law today is that best practices are for beginners. Now, I want to talk about what I mean about this just for a second, because I feel like best practices are kind of like training wheels, as you can see here. They can add a lot of value when you're first starting out, but the reality is that you know, they, if you keep the training wheels on too long, you never can grow out of it and, and learn to ride a, a real bike. And it's the same thing with CRO. So many people go immediately to these best practices, these beginner tactics, that they never learn what works best for their specific site visitors. And that's really where data can come in. So applying best practices is a great way to achieve average results. This is from a professor who actually studied wine. Uh, you're in Willamette Valley here, some of the best wines in the world. If you haven't been wine tasting it before you leave town, I highly recommend you do it. But what he found was he applied a whole bunch of best practices to, to making wine. And what he found was two things. One is that adopting best practices that are wrong can actually, for you, can actually destroy the wine. Right. So he applied best practices, to different types of grapes. It just it made the wine undrinkable. And it, the same thing can happen that if you apply best practices to your site blindly without understanding the data, you, too, will um, have an issue with that. So 
as an example of this, we're going to talk a little bit uh, for a second about Slack and Cole Haan. So most of you should know who Slack, what Slack is. Cole Haan's a shoe manufacturer. They were owned by Nike for a number of years. But the reality is that during COVID, brand collaborations were a best practice everybody wanted to do. If uh, Justin Bieber mentioned Crocs, and then all of a sudden their, their, their sales shot up 300%. And so everybody said, let's do a brand collaboration and let's get uh, more sales out of this. So in theory, this was a good application of a best practice. Combine Slack and Kohan and two audiences, right? That uh, are maybe complementary, right? Everybody was working from home, wanted some comfortable shoes. Everybody all of a sudden was on Slack and these digital platforms like that. But just because a best practice showed a correlation doesn't mean that it's going to work for you. And uh, it doesn't mean that the, it will have the same cause for your brand, right? And in fact, Cole Haan and, and Slack, this didn't work at all. They, their sales tanked and they ended up only selling these shoes at about an 80% discount just to get rid of them. Because let's be honest, Slack, Cole Haan, if I'm on Slack, doesn't mean I like Cole Haan shoes. If I have Cole Haan shoes, doesn't mean I want to be on Slack. It was best practice by uh, you know, taking uh, best practice too far. So you really have two options here. Applying best practices is, it's really like prescribing before you diagnose. I like to make this doctor analogy, right? The bad way to do this is if you were to walk into a doctor and say, hey, doctor, you know, I think I need X drug. And they said, great, here's a prescription. Go ahead and get it. And they didn't do any diagnose, uh, diagnosis. You would not only have bad results coming out of that, but that's considered malpractice. It's actually illegal, right? It's the same thing that you really should be diagnosing before you prescribe. So going back to the data, you have to understand what people are doing on your site and why. And that's really the underpinnings of CRO is you need to diagnose before you prescribe and then uh, you can have a much better uh, website customer experience. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how you do that. and. Um, I really want to make the point before we move on to this, that CRO isn't a guessing game. And again, it's the scientific process. So I, I keep hitting this home because it's extremely important. It's underpinnings for true optimization of your site. So let's talk about the system for a second, a little bit here. The next term out of this is uh, you know, a data back system, right? So let's talk for a second here about what system. And that's what takes us to the next law that I want to talk about, which is that a scientific method, not silver bullets, is what you need to be paying attention to. The scientific method is what you're going to use to make sense of all that data that I've talked about. And there's three misconceptions around this that we should really talk about today. Most brands are stuck in this old way of thinking, right? That there's a good single conversion rate or benchmark or that a redesign is gonna solve all of their conversion problems, or that sometimes they're running testing on their site and they think I need to do these big tests to get big results. So I wanna dispel each of these uh, and help you understand why each of these is a misconception in CRO. So first of all, contextual baselines need to be used instead of generic benchmarks. What do I mean by this? You often hear, oh, the average conversion rate for e-commerce is 2%. Well, the reality is it's widely different across the products you're selling and the audience you're selling to, right? We've worked with everybody from uh, large boat manufacturers. If you know Mastercraft boats, they sell $100,000 speed boats. Uh, their, their conversion rate is way less than 2% because they're selling to a very specific audience at a very high price point. Right, And it's a quality product, but probably not going to convert two out of every 100 people that come to the website. And we've also worked with companies that are selling t-shirts, right? Much lower price point, generic product for a lot of people. It's going to sell much higher conversion rates. So my point in saying this is use your own data. Stop looking at what the trend lines are. The only trend that matters is your trend. If you start paying attention to that data off of your site visitors, you will learn a lot more. Second, a redesign will solve all your conversion problems. I can't tell you the number of times that brands approach us and say, I need to redesign my site, it doesn't convert. 
And a full-on redesign is really not even a service that we offer to new customers. It might be something we do down the line. But the reality is, is it's not going to do it. It's like taking all of the good things off of your site and mixing in a whole bunch of new bad things and throwing them away and building it down, right? I often say it's like uh, burning down your house to build a new one. You would never do that. You'd renovate room by room, right? And that's really what you need to do here is exploratory testing. You need to be doing A-B testing, uh, user testing, things of that sort to better understand the individual areas of your site and how you can improve it. And then continuous improvement over massive tests. Uh, really want to look at that as well. So we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a second. So we'll talk for a second here then about this company that we worked with, uh, which is an eyewear company. And what I want to say here is that there are really, we've worked with three eyewear companies over the history of, of the good. One had heavy computer users, the other was older adults, and the third was sports enthusiasts. And that was their target market. Now, they all sold glasses. But if we compare the conversion rates for each of these, they were wildly different, right? The older adults, they sold also in CVS and Walgreens on the rack, you know, spend, you can go get your readers, right? Um, the heavy computer users were looking for a very technical product, blue blocking lenses that reduced eye strain, right? And sports enthusiasts wanted heavy duty eyewear that wouldn't break, right? And they were all three different price points all three different audiences and all three completely different methods for converting, but they're all within eyewear. So if you just looked at this industry and said, what's the average conversion rate of eyewear? It really is not helpful for you. I've talked a lot about uh, redesigns and burning down your building to start a new one. Um, the reality here is, uh, you know, really, you just want to renovate room by room. And the best way to do that is through testing. So trying out small changes on each of your pages in each section of your site, that's going to get you way better results than if you were to just scrape it all and start over again. And then I mentioned that big tests uh, versus continual improvements. We have run hundreds of thousands of tests now at The Good. Just for 15 years, we've been doing this. We've run a lot of A-B tests. And I think it's, it's something that is really interesting. We have a scale that we uh, rate all of our tests on based on complexity. Uh, we actually have multiple axes on this, but the one that's important here is that is the complexity of the test. A 10 is like a full page redesign that we're testing essentially, right? It's, it's burning everything down, starting over. It's the most complex to build, maybe complex functionality on that page. A one is maybe like changing, a, swapping a photo, changing a headline, right? So it kind of gives you some ideas there. What we found here is that um, a one small test really did not have as much impact as a four, but a four had way more than a 10. So a smaller test can actually produce way better results for you. So I want you to be thinking about what are the, the smaller things that you can test that you can be more effective with. So again, to sum up the scientific law that uh, you want to use the scientific method instead of silver bullets, is that CRO is not that one and done guessing game. So let's go back to the definition really quick here for the next step. Uh, we want to talk about visitors, right? And why they are important. Gathering data is meaningful, but putting in a scientific system is, that works to increase the, the conversion rate of your visitors matters. But this is where really a lot of companies have a hard time getting out of the jar. So the next law here is that you can't read the label from inside the jar. All of us are too close to our products. We're too close to our websites. We have a really hard time understanding what it's like for a new to file customer. Somebody who just Googled a term, clicked on a link that ended up at your page, what is it like for them? It's very difficult for, for all of us as marketers to understand that. So I want to give an example of this. We once worked with a brand that sold environmentally friendly paint, and they sold it through their own website and retailers like Home Depot here in the United States. And what we found was that on their homepage, when they first came to us, they had a lot of these retail partners' logos prominently displayed. right? And 
the brand's thought process was basically, hey, if we have that social proof of all these great brands like Home Depot and Lowe's, et cetera, Ace Hardware, et cetera, that we're available in, everyone will think we're the best paint company, right? So what they started seeing, though, was that they had a really high bounce rate and extremely low conversions. Nobody was buying their product off their website. And they didn't know why. So when they came to us, we did a bunch of research. And we found out that the problem was visitors did not arrive and think, wow, look at all these great logos. They must be the best paint brand ever. No. Instead, they saw big box logos and immediately assumed that you couldn't buy it off the website, that you had to go to the store to get it. So there is a disconnect there, right? They had a hard time understanding what consumers were doing on the website and what they were thinking versus what they wanted to project, which was, hey, confidence, right? But visitors didn't even realize they could buy something. So once we had gathered that out of the jar perspective for them, we had our diagnosis and we knew what to prescribe. So our team's highest priority became testing the menu and creating a shoppable focused version. So this is the navigation originally at the top, which was super brand focused, right? It was, they had shop, yes, but everything else was more about the brand, their projects, the certifications, FAQs. And it, along with uh, removing the logos, we also ended up redesigning this navigation to be much more focused on products and the brand. So you can see at the bottom, what we ended up with was uh, paints, primers, stain and varnish, concrete products and samples all about what they offer and how they help you solve your pain or need when you come to this site, right? So I encourage you all to shift the focus away from your brand and be thinking about the visitor. What are their needs? And the best way to do that is to talk to them. So how do you know you need to talk to brands? Well, or to consumers? Well, we call these... Uh, stuck symptoms, right? These are things that you see on your site that help you understand that you need to start talking to consumers. Everything from category dropdowns that are organized like a warehouse, right? As a brand, we're going to organize our navigation like we would uh, organize our warehouse because it makes sense to us. We know our products, right? Or um, having that brand-focused navigation or uh, you know, even focusing on manufacturing details in the product descriptions instead of the pain points we're solving for the consumers. So what can you do about this if you're stuck? Well, one option is to hire somebody to pull you out of the jar. And that's partly what we do at The Good. But the other is to build a ladder and climb out yourself. So how do you go about doing that? The best way is to get into your customer's shoes. And by that, I mean listening in both quantitative and qualitative ways. So. Quantitative listening methods include things like analytics, A-B testing, uh, looking at your website chat logs. I talked to people this morning that are putting chat on their site uh, with some success. And I think there's, um, you know, even doing large-scale user surveys, but getting data points from your consumers is really what's going to be important here. And then you can understand what they're doing, right, instead of uh, what they're saying. And I think that's important, but it's really not enough. Because you also want to understand why they're doing that. And that's where qualitative comes in. Doing things like user testing. This is where you would send people to your site, match your ideal customer profiles, ask them to complete some tasks, ideally while you're recording their screen and their audio. And you're asking them to talk out loud about the experience that they're having. What that's going to do is put you right in outside of the jar with them or bring them inside the jar. Either way, you're getting much closer to that consumer. So you can just interview them as well. Or what I prefer to do is actually talk to your customer service teams, understand what challenges the consumers are having that they're calling customer service for. That will give you a lot of great insight. One good example of this is Easton. Now, I recognize this is a B2C example, not so much B2B as, as most of the folks in this room are, but it, the lesson applies. So I wanted to talk about it. So... Easton, if you don't know who they are, they're the world's biggest manufacturer of baseball equipment. And uh, if you've ever heard of a Little League World Series here in the United States, it's a huge event. 
every swing done there is typically done with an Easton baseball bat. Uh, also, 99% of college baseball swings are done with the bat. Now, they make metal bats, aluminum bats, so you can't use them in major leagues. Um, so they're not in the major leagues, but they own that market below the major leagues. Easton approaches, they were lagging in direct to consumer sales. And what I mean by that is that they own the marketplace for the folks that are in there. But if I just, I have a six year old, if I just put him in Little League, um, I would just go buy the cheapest bat because I don't know what to buy him. Right. And so we, what they found in customer service was that a lot of people were calling in and saying, I have this bat. And then my son got up to bat in his Little League, and the umpire said he's not allowed to use that bat. What do I do? And they found this problem because we asked the customer service team to log interactions with customers over two days. Not, we didn't need more than two days. And what we found out here was that consumers went to Easton's website and you would click on bats and it would be a wall of bats. And they'd all look like these little sticks and, you know, on the product page, category page. And you could not tell any difference between them. They had a little bit of different coloring, maybe. That was it. You'd click on one and it was a ton of technical details. And it would say it's certified for these leagues, but a parent doesn't really know what the certification is that's needed. And so there was a lot of confusion. And what happened was Easton was trying to sell the products based on the language they knew, not the language their consumers were using. And it was confusing the heck out of parents. So they were having the disappointing brand uh, experience where they would let their kid go to practice, use the bat. It would get marked up and dinged up a little bit. They'd take it to a game. They'd swing, get to the bat. Uh, batter's box in the umpire would say, you can't, you can't use this. And now a parent is stuck with a several hundred dollar bat that they feel like they can't return. And so they were calling customer service. So what we did here was uh, figured out that we need to help people through that purchase process. We created a bat filter. And now if you go to Easton's website, you uh, can select what league your kid is in. You can select what type of hitter they are. Are they swinging for the fences for home runs? Or are they just trying to get on base? Right. And so talking through this with parents, we found out that there were a couple of key uh, things that would help them to understand what bat was best for their child. And so being able to help filter through this made a big difference to the tune of 240% revenue and we brought that to mobile because we, later, because uh, secondary research showed us that uh, consumers were pulling up Easton's website while they were standing in Dick's Sporting Goods. And there was, again, a wall of bats in front of them. They had no idea what bat they needed. And it was even worse uh, at a store because there were no description pages. So we brought it all that experience to mobile and it helped them to understand um, which bat they should be buying. And um, what we found was most of the parents would then just click buy on their phone instead of getting the bat right there. So the big idea here is that uh, you can't understand that new to file experience. You are just too close to your brand. So you have to find ways to get out of the jar. So let's put all of this into practice. And uh, thank you to Annalisa for, for being, as you put it, the guinea pig. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the Autodex page here off of their site. And um, I have um, collected a bunch of data that I want to walk through. So this is the landing page. Who here knows what a heat map is? I get a, yeah. Okay. So if you don't know, all you need to know about heat maps is uh, that where it's hotter, red, is where more people got their attention and where more people are spending their time looking. There's multiple types of heat maps out there. The type that we're using is eye tracking. So this tells us what gets attention, are people reading the content, and uh, you know, how long they're looking at that content, right? So the darker is it's getting more attention and people are spending more time looking at it. Where it cools off, like this big block of text, is where people aren't looking at all, okay? So that's mainly what you need to know here. And what I'm going to do is go through this page, uh, start at the top of the page and work our way down. And we're going to just call out some things that, that I see here based on this data and um, our 15 years of experience. So you can see here that nobody's looking at the navigation. Part of the challenge here is the first thing is about us. 
right? So a consumer, and especially in Western cultures, we're starting the top left and we look over to the right and then we do like a, it's an F pattern it's called, right? So start top left, look over, go down a little bit, look over again, then keep going down. So if we're following the F pattern here, you can see nobody, they hit about us and then they just immediately go down because like, I'm not, I'm not here to learn about that brand. I'm here to solve my pain or need. I need Autodesk software, right? So they see Autodesk, they're like, oh, I'm in the right spot, right? Which is great because then if we keep going down here, we want them to know that they're at Autodesk, but then nobody's reading about the company. So again, this is about the brand, not about how you're helping solve the consumer's challenge. So then they're looking over here and saying, oh, Autodesk will partner. Okay, I'm still in the right spot. And I'm not ready to contact yet because I don't really know if you're going to solve that pain or need. So if we go down the page a little bit, this is the next scroll. Again, we're focusing here on client satisfaction and about the brand. I call these large paragraphs walls of text because what we find is people hit these and they immediately stop and move on to something else or a lot of times bounce off the page because they hit they let's face it, we're all a little bit lazy when we're, we're on the internet. We would rather skim a page instead of read everything. And it makes sense. So really things like this should just be bullet points. What are the main few words that we want people to know? And same thing with down here. Now we're finally getting into some of the ways that we can help in very easy to understand formats. And that's why they're getting a lot of attention, right? So it's very clearly saying, this is, oh, these are for me. This is how I can help. One other thing I haven't highlighted here, but we're all drawn to faces. So the more faces you put on the site, the better generally, but they can be a distraction as well. So you can see nobody was really reading his quote. They're just looking at him. The problem with this is psychologically, what we're saying is, do I think he could be my friend? Would I like him? And you're doing it just based on the picture. We're all passing that judgment. It's been proven. The challenge is, we shouldn't really care about what he looks like, right? We should care about what he's saying about doing business with this company. If we keep going down here, you can see that we immediately next go into the software and then we can buy the software online. Okay, great. Now we're getting a little closer to what I want, but I have the challenge. If I come here and I don't know exactly what I need, I have to read through each of these blocks and I'm given a little paragraph to help me decide if that's exactly what I need. And then I don't even have the option to learn more. I have the option to buy it right now. So if I'm not sure if AutoCAD is what I need, I'm still, my only option is to buy it. So now I'm stuck. Like I'm not ready to buy it yet, right? I want to learn more. And so it becomes a challenge. So I really encourage everybody to use what I call low intent to purchase call to actions. Lower that barrier. Something like learn more, view details, right? To all your, your whole goal should just be to get people to take the next step in the funnel, right? Trying to close the deal right now is like me walking up to uh, somebody and say, hey, you want to be my friend? And we just met, right? Probably not cool, right? They're going to be like, get away from me, right? So as we keep going down the page, you can see here, it's the same thing. And it's just rows of these with very little data. And you can see that some of them, the shorter ones are getting read because they're like, oh, well, Maybe there's something here of value. But then again, you have this larger one that you can see. I wanted to highlight the difference here, right? So shorter content like that works better. Bullet points works better than paragraphs, right? Low intent to purchase. And then we come down and all of a sudden we're discontinued. And you can see here that it says discontinued. Nobody reads this long, long thing of text, right? Everybody drops off about here, as you can see. Um, and the challenge really with this is um, it's getting a lot of, you know, we can't even sell this product because it's discontinued and it's getting a lot of attention. So that tells me that as people got further down the page that they still haven't found what they're looking for. They're still trying to gather information, all right? And they're like, maybe what I really wanted was something that's now discontinued. That's just going to end up being a world of hurt for them when they do see, oh, I'm used to AutoCAD 2019 for Mac and I can't have it anymore, right? But here I can learn more, right? <laughs> so it might be that now I might go in and dive in deeper to a product I can't even buy anymore. 
you can see how this is a journey that would be a challenge for a visitor when you start getting outside the jar and thinking about this. Again, as we scroll down, now we have some specializations. So I highlighted this because I would think as I'm a consumer that these would be things I might be interested in. So now I'm starting to look at these, but I'm not really interested in gold partner because that's about you, not about me, my needs, right? But maybe I'm in architecture, engineering, and construction. So I should be able to click that and go to this. The challenge is these aren't clickable. So if I want more information, I see something, but I can't dive deeper. So key things like this need to be uh, interactive, need to be call to actions. And be able to take that next step. How can Autodesk and how can your software you're selling help me out with that? And lastly, as we're wrapping up, I want to get down to the footer. Um, there's a couple of things that should be in the footer. We call it the trust trifecta. Uh, there's three things that should be in everyone's footer that increase trust immediately. Uh, the first is uh, how to get a hold of you. So contact information is great. However, you don't want to drive people off of your site. People make this mistake a lot where they put social in their footer or up and even in the top nav or throughout their page. And really the only thing you're doing there is sending people into a black hole. Right. If I end up on Twitter or LinkedIn or YouTube, any of these, I'm not coming back to your site. Right. Because their whole job is to keep me on their site. Right. And that's why we all get stuck in the doom scrolling on Instagram, et cetera. Right. So, three things again contact information. Uh, you want to have, um, you know, ideally a phone number, an email address, and a physical address. The physical address, very few, nobody's going to show up at your door. Very few people care about it. They just want to know that it's there. They want to know, hey, if I have an issue, you're not hiding from me. And this, the, you know, it's less of an issue in B2B because there's some inherent trust there. But especially in B2C, it's like, I want to know you're not running an e-commerce site out of your parents' basement. And I'm going to give you my credit card information. And then I'm never going to get my products. And, but I'll have a whole bunch of extra charges on my card. So I uh, want to be thinking about that. All right. So I know my time is coming up here. Um, so um, I wanted to share this with you. Um, feel free to take a shot of this QR code. Um, this is good for uh, $10 off the book. If you're international, you don't want to pack it, take it back. Um, go to the site. You can also use code Autodesk and get a copy of the book. Uh, we also have an encyclopedia. Again, we've been doing this for 15 years. Uh, I call it our encyclopedia of conversion. We have a ton of articles. If you're struggling with your navigation, you can go to the good.com slash insights. There's a big search bar up top. Type in navigation. You'll get all of the relevant articles, research reports, everything we've done on any topic you have around converting people on your website. And then if you like this type of content I showed today and you want it delivered to you, feel free to go to our newsletter and sign up. Uh, it's never a sales pitch. It's not an update about who, what we're doing. It is helpful content that our team produces every single week based on what we're learning and seeing out in the industry. And lastly, if you have questions, want to follow up, I, I know I, uh, Israel said I'll be back here. Feel free to email me anytime. I do read every email and try to respond. Uh, so I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Awesome. Let's hear it for John. That was amazing. A lot of really good, what I call tweetable moments or tweetable comments. <laughs> also, let's plug your Twitter because you do have really good content on, on the socials. Yeah. Yeah. Twitter is just uh, at John McDonald, my name. At John uh, McDonald. So yeah. Great, great. LinkedIn as well. Perfect. Thank you, John.